All right. Hello, everyone. So uh, this will be the first lecture I record from my classroom. Um, I'm back now, and uh, they're making us all go to our classroom and get ready. So you'll notice a different background and stuff, but it should work fine. I got the same setup here. Can't wait for uh, those of you to come back who are coming back. That'll be a lot of fun. I'm getting everything ready for that. So last time we left off on the civil rights era, hugely important in American history. We took a huge step forward in moving towards racial progress. Many people, especially young people today, they look, they look at America today and they say, this is so messed up, this is terrible. And they're not wrong about certain things, but I think sometimes they lose perspective because they might know bits and pieces of history. They know that uh, America had this awful record of slavery and Jim Crow. And then they, you know, point to inequalities today. And they're not wrong about a lot of the connections. But what they miss is that there was a huge leap forward during the civil rights movement. If you look at where African Americans status as socioeconomic, legal, political, everything was in the 50s and compare it to just two decades later, there was a quantum leap forward. Most African Americans could not vote in this country in 1964. And today, anybody can vote anywhere. Now, Georgia did pass these restrictions, but notice they're, they're not nearly as prohibitive as the Jim Crow era ones, right? Like now, Georgia's a state that's like 38, 39% African-American. Um, and and African-Americans in Georgia vote in huge numbers, much more than the white population in, in most states. And uh, it's not like during the Jim Crow era where you had laws that said, if you can't read, you can't vote. If you can't pay the poll tax, you can't vote. If you can't register in January, you can't vote. I mean, basically it was darn near impossible to vote back then and now it's much much easier you know you got to have a form of id and you got to have two signatures and they put all these loops up but notice they can't go back to the olden days because we have a voting rights act now it would be totally illegal and the feds would show up in georgia and overturn all those laws so it's almost pathetic some of the restrictions that they're doing today that that aren't going to change things probably very much at all um in any case uh Civil rights was a huge leap forward. And this happened during this decade of the 60s. It starts in the 50s, but it kind of comes to fruition in the, in the 60s. The 1960s is one of the most transformative decades in American history. Uh, and it was the most transformative since the 1860s in 100 years. I would argue we might be living through similar times now. I never thought, I mean, I was born in 1979. I grew up in the 80s and 90s when things were very calm and mellow. There, you didn't see mass protest demonstrations. You didn't see people storming the Capitol. There's been a lot of political upheaval in the last 10 years or so. And I don't look for it to end anytime soon. Um, and so we'll see if you know this is going to be taken in a positive direction or not. But the 60s were very much like this. And it was coming out of a decade that was pretty boring and mellow, the 50s, right? Although there were some you know, rumblings about beatniks talking about conformity and folk music and civil rights movement started. The 60s, it would all explode. So let me share my screen with you. And we'll talk about the groovy 60s. It was far out, man. So this is an iconic image. It's kind of a silly image, actually. You have the you know long hair hippie guy here, and he's putting a flower in the barrel of the gun. This was at a protest at the Pentagon in 1967, at the height of the Vietnam War, and these people, you know, carrying these simple-minded placards that said, you know, make love, not war. Right? Oh, that, isn't that clever? That's going to bring about world peace. You know, maybe if we just put a flower in the barrel of every gun, then beauty would conquer hate, right? The instrument of beauty, the flower is going to literally stop the bullet in this, this gun, this instrument of death. Um, it's symbolic. It was kind of silly. And it was very easy to sort of uh, pigeonhole the hippies as, you know, unwashed homeless people that needed to get jobs, right? And that's how most America saw them at the time. Um, but it's a great image nonetheless, and it showed this generation gap. Young people did not really understand older people. That, to me, is fundamentally what's going on today. Uh, young people very much have, have um, attached themselves to the social justice movement, to the woke movement. 
People in older generations don't understand it, don't get it. My generation, Generation X, is kind of split in the middle. Half of us kind of are with the younger millennials and Generation Z, and uh, half of us are kind of with the boomers. Um, but largely, this was also a creature of the 60s, that young people born, baby boomers born after World War II, saw the world very differently than their parents, incredibly differently. And this was the source of almost all of the issues of the 1960s. Now, the first thing that comes up that's rather interesting is we have a new president. John F. Kennedy was killed in November of 1963 and Lyndon Johnson gets in there. And to me, it's an absolute historical crime that LBJ is almost forgotten uh, at this particular time in history or all he's remembered for. And, and when I was young, what I learned from my parents and from my teachers was, oh yeah, he was that no good. Uh, liar who got us into Vietnam and lost us our first war, uh, which is not untrue. He did do that, but it forgets all these amazing things that Lyndon Johnson did. His list of accomplishments is, is extraordinary. He's one of the most effective presidents we ever had. The problem is that Vietnam overshadows almost everything else. Lyndon Johnson gets in there and understand he had been in government for almost 30 years uh, kind of like Joe Biden that way, had just been around forever. He had been Senate Majority Leader for a long time, Vice President. He knew how the Congress worked better than anybody. And he got in there in late 63 and he went to town saying, I want to be like FDR. Like when I was a young congressman from Texas in the 30s, FDR was my idol. He taught me everything I knew. And he was a big proponent of the New Deal. And Johnson basically had the idea, the New Deal was amazing and great, and we did all this wonderful stuff, but it was during the Great Depression. We were broke. We didn't have the money to do everything we wanted to do. Now we're an incredibly rich country. We have more money than everybody else. Uh, the government's not running these huge debts like we are today. And so there was this capacity and this feeling that we had to change things. Lyndon Johnson went out to places like in this picture here in West Virginia and talked to people there without running water who still had to chop firewood to heat their homes and talk to them about their schools and their lives and everything. And he had a soft spot in his heart for the poor. This was why he latched onto civil rights as well. If all that Lyndon Johnson ever did was the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65, he would go down in history as one of the greatest presidents. But he did so much more than that. And yet still, it's like, oh, Kennedy, he was handsome. It's like, what's LBJ, chop liver? He actually did stuff, right? Sorry, I'm a little biased on this. Um, so. Johnson wanted to launch a program kind of like a new New Deal that he called the Great Society. It's been controversial ever since. Conservatives tend to think it was A, a waste of money, and B, counterproductive. It actually produced the results it sought to alleviate, right? Like it made poverty worse. It made, you know, all these problems worse. Uh, liberals think the Great Society was kind of the last hurrah in America. It was the last time where there was the will to reach out and help the poor. You just don't see that very much anymore. You're starting to see rumblings of it and we'll see if things change. But like, it's amazing to me to reflect on the fact that the homeless problem is out of control in this country. If you guys have been to LA recently, it's, it's appalling. You didn't have that stuff in the 50s and 60s. It gets complicated, but the main reason is because in the 50s and 60s, if, if you had a family member that you just couldn't take care of, you could go to a doctor and have them evaluated. And if a doctor and two family members decided to have that person committed, they signed the papers and that person would be taken into a hospital uh, and cared for. Now the hospitals were often not great, but it was a lot better than just being out on the streets, right? What happened in the eighties is government started to say, this is too expensive. And also there was the feeling that people were being locked up without their consent, right? Like their family members were just trying to get rid of them. And so we wanted to liberate these people. And what's happened is the homeless population is mushroomed in this country. In 1963, there were about a quarter of a million people in government run hospitals in this country. And we were half the population, which means per capita, we should have about a half a million people in government run hospitals today. We don't, we have something like 15, 20,000. It's a small, it's only if you're a danger to yourself or other, if you're homicidal or you're suicidal, we'll lock you up and not forever either. It's just until you're not homicidal or suicidal anymore, right? Most people who have suicidal thoughts or attempt suicide, it's just once in a brief period in their lives and then they get better and then they're released, right? 
many of them have psychological issues, many of them have drug abuse, and then they just wind up on the streets. And we have half a million or more homeless people in America today. And it it's, blows my mind that no one seems to care. Everyone just says, well, that's on them, right? And it's like, yeah, but have you seen downtown LA? You can't even go anywhere anymore. It's, it's unbelievable. There's just a tent city there. And this is supposedly good economic times. In the 60s, the attitude is we have to care for the less fortunate. All of these baby boomers born in 1946 and after were finally graduating from high school, going to college. Kennedy had told them to sacrifice for their country. And a lot of these kids were joining the Peace Corps to go off to foreign countries and, uh, and to help out the poor there, which was a great idea. Johnson wanted to harness this energy of young white middle-class kids and send them all over the country to help out. And so Johnson created the War on Poverty. August 1964, this created the OEO, the Office of Economic Opportunity. It sounds amazing, but before 1964, we don't really have reliable uh, unemployment data or poverty data. We just don't know what the poverty rate was in 1952 because the government did not calculate it. Now, states kind of did their own and you can sort of extrapolate, but it's kind of dicey. Why is this? Well, prior to the 60s, the attitude was rugged individualism. You lift yourself up by your own bootstraps. The 60s, the attitude was yes, but many people have been held back. Women, minorities, right? And just poor white folks too had been sort of you know underserved as well, living in Appalachia. They need help as well. And so the government came out and created a slew of programs, the Job Corps, VISTA, which is Volunteers in Service to America, CAP, the Community Action Program, legal services, right? If you're poor and your landlord's harassing you or welfare offices are trying to kick you off when you still deserve another year of, of, uh, of benefits, you can go to one of these lawyers and they'll take on your case for free, right? The taxpayer will pay for it. Head Start, this was giving young children a start before kindergarten, right? What do middle class and rich people do? They send their kids to daycare and preschool so that they're ready, so that when they walk into a kindergarten class, they know their ABCs, they know their one, two, threes, they know their address, they know how to write their name, etc. cetera. Um, a lot of poor folks, they are exhausted, they're working two, three jobs, and they don't know what the standards are, right? My wife and I are educators, so we knew before our kids started kindergarten, where should he be with his standards? Where should he be with his his skill set, and we made sure that he was he was ready for it the first day. Head Start would help out for the poor that way. You could drop your kid off at a community like daycare center that was a Head Start center, and they'd start working with them in a preschool kind of way. Birth control programs, these get very controversial, but Planned Parenthood existed in the 60s, and the government started to fund them. Not abortion services. Remember, abortion is illegal in every state in the union in the 60s. It's not until the early 70s until some of those laws start to get overturned and then Roe v. Wade will strike down all of the uh, restrictions. But the government started to give money to Planned Parenthood for birth control so that if you were too poor to afford the pill, you could go and the government would give it to you. Which to me sounds like a good idea because that would decrease poverty, right? The number one source of poverty is having kids before you're ready, right? If you're 16, 17 and you have a kid and you don't have your career set up, it's gonna be very difficult for you. If you wait until your mid, late 20s or later, then you have a better chance. And so if we offer birth control and people take it, it should help the problem, right? Other people, many conservatives got very upset about it, that we were funding the breakdown of the family, people having sex out of wedlock, et cetera, which I don't really agree that that's what it does, but many people were iffy about the government paying for that stuff. Medicaid, this, I should have put like a little asterisk by this one, this is, the most important part of the whole great society, um, or not Medicaid, excuse me, but Medicare, but both of them together were, were pretty big. Um, and it represented some 75% of all the money in the war on poverty. Okay, so how does Medicare work? Well, Lyndon Johnson noticed a problem. Uh, Social Security was wonderful. That was created in 1935, but um, it didn't cover health care. And you had a lot of older folks in their late 60s and 70s and 80s, and they were taking their social security check and going to the doctor and spending it all there. Old people go to the doctor a lot, you know. My parents are in their 70s and they're they constantly are having doctor's appointments because they have health care issues. Now, when you have a private health insurance, right? Because when you retire, you're often thrown off of your government or your, your job sponsored health care, right? Like if you worked at GM your whole life, GM pays for your health care, but when you retire, you don't get it anymore. Right? You got to go out of pocket and buy your own insurance. 
insurance companies don't want to insure older people. They're a walking, talking, pre-existing condition, right? Uh, so insurance is all about risk, right? Like if you're a driver, you pay your premiums every month so that when you get in a catastrophic accident, the insurance company will pay for everything. So younger drivers have to pay more than older drivers. Younger drivers are usually not as good. Men, you know, take a lot of risks when they drive. Uh, women tend not to. And so if you're a young man, you pay through the roof. If you've had multiple accidents, you pay more. If you've got multiple DUIs, you're going to pay more. That's how insurance works, right? You take riskier candidates and you charge them a higher premium, or you just flat out say, you are too much of a risk. We're not going to insure you at any price. And that's what they did with older folks. They said, if you're over 65, you are going to get sick. You are going to go to the doctor. It's a guarantee within the next five years. So we don't want to insure you. So older people would literally pay cash, not even insurance, but cash to see a doctor blowing their whole social security check every month and then sliding back into poverty. So what Johnson said is what we should do is what the Canadians do and the French do and the Japanese do, but just do it for the elderly, right? So in those other countries I just mentioned, they have a social insurance fund. So the way it works is in those countries is the hospitals are privately owned. The doctors and nurses are privately hired. You can go to anyone you want and you go to that hospital. And when the bill is due, you just show them your government insurance card and the government pays for either all of it or the vast majority of it. That's how South Korea works, Canada, France, et cetera. Britain's a little different. Britain, the government owns the hospitals themselves and there's no insurance. In the other countries, the hospitals are private, but the bill is paid through a social insurance fund. So everyone's covered. No one has the fear that they're going to get sick with some horrible thing like cancer and get bankrupted from it. You know, people get sick in these other countries, but usually they catch it earlier because you can go to the doctor whenever you want. And uh, it actually keeps costs down. It's weird, but they cover everybody and costs are much lower because government can negotiate. In our country, we cover only about 85% of the population. Uh, it's a patchwork of multiple systems and it's highly inefficient. We're basically paying double per capita that these other countries are paying. Johnson knew that he couldn't get the whole country insured. That th it, that was a non-starter. You couldn't go to Congress and say, let's do what the French do and cover everybody. Because again, this issue comes up over race. Southern congressmen would say, if black people are going to get free stuff and health insurance, we don't want to pay for it. We don't think they should get it, right? Is that still in the early 60s, domestic workers and um, agricultural workers did not get social security. So that meant domestic workers, that was black women and Hispanic women and uh, agricultural workers, that means black and Hispanic men, basically. They, did, they could not get it at all. Sorry, my phone's going off here. Okay, so um, Johnson wanted to change this and he said, at least I could get it for 65 and older. Because I don't think older people, Americans have a soft spot in their hearts for the military, right? Milita if you're a veteran, if you're a hero, you shouldn't pay for anything. We should take care of you, which is why we have the VA, right? And why we have pensions for veterans um, and the GI Bill. Kids, if you're a kid, it's not your fault. You live in poverty. You know, we should help you out. And if you're elderly, it's like you paid your dues, you worked, you, you, you know. If you're in that middle, if you're like an able-bodied person from like 18 to 65, it's like, eh, it's on you, right? F figure it out on your own. And so this was the beginning of that. Uh, there's sort of, uh, the best way to think of Medicare is it's the Siamese twin to social security, right? Once you're 65, the government sends you a check every month and they pay for your medical bills mostly, right? I think they pay 80% or something like that, but you can get what's called Medicare Advantage or Medicare Plus, where you pay a little bit more of a premium and then Medicare does take care of everything. You can do it that way, or you can just do general Medicare. And that's the way it works. You're over 65, you get your little card, you show it to the doctor and the government pays for most of your bills. You have to pay a little bit of it. People get supplemental insurance and it covers the rest. So um, this was a hugely popular program. It's very expensive. It's incredibly expensive, um, but Americans love it. I mean, if you told Americans tomorrow, we're going to cut social security and Medicare, there would be riots. Like old people be out in their walkers, you know, with the tennis balls on the bottom and they'd be like shaking them at the Capitol because old people vote. They have nothing else to do with their time, right? They go to Denny's at three o'clock and they eat their dinner. Then they go out and they watch the news and then they vote, right? Because they have all this time on their hands. I'm teasing the old folks. My parents are older. I love old people, but it's, you know, trying to make a little comedy here. So, um, these are immensely popular programs. Even the Republican Party that some members claim that they want to cut this, it's bad for the budget, 
they're not actually going to cut it because these are immensely popular. If you poll Americans, what do you think of Social Security and Medicare? They get 90% approval. People love them. You know, it's... It's interesting. Some people will look at American society and say, oh, it's so sick and awful. We used to move grandma and grandpa into our own homes and take care of them ourselves. Now we just send them to a home and say, we don't want to. It's a little more complicated than that. Women started to go in the workplace in the 70s. Most women in America aren't home all day anymore to, to take care of uh, the elderly, right? Their parents or grandparents or whatever. Uh, men and women in most households, both of them are working all the time. They don't have the time or the resources to take care of an invalid parent. So they like that. And guess what? You ask older people, they don't want to live with their kids. Typically they, they feel like a burden. They want to be independent. And so the system's much more benign than some people make it out to be like, oh, we're just paying for grandpa to be warehoused in some place. Grandpa wants to be there. Typically he doesn't want to move in with you and, and cramp your style so much, you know? Some families are different, but by and large, that's what the polls show us. Now, um, the problem with the war on poverty is that 75% of the money went to this one program, Medicare. And guess what? You didn't get it till you were 65 and older. 65 was basically the life expectancy at the time. Uh, it was a little later than that. I think it was 68, 69. Um, but that was for white people. Most African-Americans never lived long enough to get Medicare. And most poor folks never live long enough. If you're poor, you're less likely to see a doctor have a good diet and you will die most likely earlier than, than a wealthier middle-class person. And so this was not really effective money spent to end poverty for the poor, but it did allevi alleviate it for older people. And one thing that a lot of people don't know, poverty used to be really high in America in the 50s. I mean, we don't imagine that because we look at TV and everyone lived in the suburbs, right? Donna Reed and Lucy and Ricky, it, it looked like a wonderful time. The statistics show that the poverty rates were appalling. Almost a third of Americans live below the poverty line. Poverty is defined as your income is not sufficient enough to take care of your basic needs, your housing, your food, you know, clothing, et cetera. And you need some form of government assistance. A third of all Americans did not make enough money to do that. You know, that's kind of the dirty little secret about American life is that despite all the opportunity, despite the wealth, we've always had poverty in this country. We still do. But it was cut in half basically by these programs and went down to about 15% when it had been 30%. Um, but there was still this racial discrepancy, right? Is that poverty went down for everyone, but it was still about three times worse for minorities than it was for white Americans. Um, and really the major issue with the war on poverty was that we were simultaneously fighting a war in Vietnam at the same time, which was much more expensive and was draining the federal treasury. And we eventually had to cut back on the war on poverty so that we could stop the communists. And guess what? We didn't, we lost both wars. We lost the war on poverty and we lost the war in Vietnam. Martin Luther King did a little analysis and he found out that if you took all the dollars spent on the war on poverty and divided by the number of poor, you would get $53 per poor person. That's just not serious dealing with the issue. Do you think with $53, you could turn somebody's life around? I don't think you could, because guess what? Poor people have credit cards. They can borrow $53 and that's not gonna make a difference. That's not gonna get you educated. It's not gonna get you daycare to take care of your kids so you can go get a job. You're gonna need thousands of dollars, probably tens of thousands of dollars to get yourself out of poverty. And it's just $53 ain't gonna cut it. It just wasn't enough. Yet, we, he, Martin Luther King took the same amount of money that was spent on the war in Vietnam divided by the number of enemy killed and found out that we were spending $350,000 for each Viet Cong soldier that we killed in that war, which is pretty darned expensive. So where's the priorities, right? $350,000 to kill each enemy or $53 on each poor person. This is when Martin Luther King uh, got uninvited from the White House. Lyndon Johnson partnered with him and brought him to the White House to sign the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65 and be at the ceremony. In 1966, uh, Martin Luther King gave a big speech against the Vietnam War saying that black men were being drafted in twice the numbers as whites, and it was true. Being asked to sacrifice 13,000 miles away for the rights of people in Vietnam when they didn't have any rights back home and still in many situations were discriminated against, couldn't vote, et cetera. And he said, 
I'm here demonstrating against the greatest purveyor of violence in the world, and that is my own government. That was pretty shocking words. People forget Martin Luther King was this much of a rebel. They just imagine, well, he demonstrated and marched and did sit-ins and demonstrated against Jim Crow. He was adamantly against the Vietnam War, and Lyndon Johnson never forgave him for that. They, they weren't friends anymore after 1965. When Martin Luther King died, he was at the lowest level of his popularity with white America. People forget that. And now he's, you know, ascended into sainthood, which justifiably so, but they forget he had an edge to him and, and he ruffled some feathers. So the war on poverty would not be a success. Um, I'll just tell you about one or two of these stories. It, it's become an incredibly controversial phenomenon to debate this now. Liberals tend to say, the war on poverty didn't do enough because it just, we didn't spend enough money. Vietnam killed it and, and we never had the will to go back. There's a little bit of truth in that. Um, conservatives have always argued that it was counterproductive. And so here's the conservative argument that if you give people welfare, if you give them money to not work, that encourages them to not work, right? If you give money to young mothers who aren't married and have kids, that encourages people to have kids out of wedlock, right? That there were a lot of these poor folks who lived in the projects, these new housing units that were developed. When the projects were built in the 50s and 60s, everybody just was stunned at how amazing they were. They were beautiful and they rapidly deteriorated. And, and there's been questions ever since, why? why? Why are the projects, they just become slums. They become terrible neighborhoods, crime infested, graffiti, et cetera. We're not exactly sure, there's various theories, but, but we do know that huddling poor folks together in huge numbers is probably not a good idea. That it's probably better to do uh, like section eight housing where they basically say, all right, you can kind of live where you wanna live and the government will subsidize it. They'll just write you a check and pay for like half your rent and you just move into whatever neighborhood you want. And so poor folks and middle-class folks are interspersed together and that's actually probably a better solution. Um, Conservatives argued that starting in the 60s, federal welfare kicked in. And again, if you were a, an unwed mother and you did not live with your husband, the government would give you a check. And government agents would come out to your home and open the closets and look for any signs that a man was living there. And, you know, if, if there were male clothes or anything, they'd say, oh, you know, you don't get your check. And so some families thought, you know, okay, we're, you know, married, but we are struggling. We can't even afford anything. So, maybe husband, you need to move out. Maybe it's just the next apartment over. Maybe it's just right down the street, but you got to take your clothes with you because the government agent comes by and we don't get that money and we're desperate to feed our kids, et cetera. And so the conservative argument was that this accelerated the breakdown of families in this country. If you guys don't know, the divorce rate's much higher now than it used to be. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the, whatever you want to call it, illegitimacy rate, the unwed you know, uh, pregnancy rate, uh, much higher today. And the argument always is that you need a two-parent household. It doesn't have to be, you know, man and wife. It doesn't have to be, you know, husband, um, uh, wife, you know, mother, father. But two adults in the household ensures that kids are supervised and you're raising them properly, right? Um, once you remove one parent, then you start to get more problems. It's not a guarantee, but the statistics do seem to show that. I think the last time I looked, they said that uh, prisoners, felons in America something like 90% of them grew up in a household without a father. And it's not that moms aren't doing their job, it's because you know dads often get divorced, they run off on their family and there's no second parent in that household. And it, it, it's very difficult. So I don't know who's actually right here, whether the war on poverty was you know ill-conceived and counterproductive or whether we just didn't seriously fund it enough. But it is true that we are a weird paradox. We are the richest country on earth, our corporations rich beyond belief, our wealthy people can kick your wealthy people off the map any day. Look at Bezos, he's unbelievably rich, Zuckerberg, Elon Musk. Yet, side by side with that great wealth is tremendous poverty. Our poverty rate's about 13, 14% of our population lives below the poverty line, which is double, triple what it is in most European countries. Why? It's not exactly clear, but probably because these other countries have unionized and they have good social welfare programs that work and they, they're designed well and they're implemented well. And we just don't have very much of that. We have Social Security, Medicare, and that's basically it. We do have some welfare program, programs, you know, food stamps, you know, aid to family with dependent children, but they don't seem to work very well. Let's talk about second wave feminism. How am I doing on time here? Okay, I think I'm pretty good. So um, 
Feminism had basically three waves to it. We're in the midst of the third wave right now. The first wave would start in 1848, Seneca Falls, with women demanding the right to vote. It was one singular issue. Almost no one else was talking about anything else. There was no issues of birth control or anything like that back then. And so women in the 1840s, 50s, and onward until 1920 were dedicated to getting the right to vote. They achieved that in 1920, and you see sort of a recession after that, not an economic recession, but like receding, like the tides. Women basically went back to their day-to-day -day lives after that. And you don't see in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, very much um, in the ways of women demonstrating and marching, demanding certain rights. Some, you know, some women were advocating birth control and other things like that. But the mass movement of getting women out to the streets demonstrating for the 19th Amendment, that went away after it was passed. Then starting in the early 60s, you saw the second wave begin to rise. This was about issues that had changed because women were now in a different world than they were in 1920. Women were trying to enter the workplace and there was immense barricades to that. Um, let me tell you a little bit about my mother. So my mother, wonderful woman, uh, born in 1947. She's a baby boomer. She graduated from high school in uh, 1965 went to college, graduated in 1969. 1969, right? We're not talking about 1961. This is after the Civil Rights Act of 64 is passed, which includes gender discrimination. And in 1969, she graduated college and the only job she could really attain was teacher or nurse. Her father asked her at the time and said, "What do you wanna just be a housewife or do you want a career? I wanna have a career. Great, you should always have a career because you never know, you may marry a guy who divorces you or doesn't take care of you. You always want to be self-sufficient. Okay, great. Teacher or nurse. That was the only jobs basically for women. Now, if you were a writer or something like that, those jobs always existed for women, right? You go back to Harriet Beecher Stowe writing Uncle Tom's Cabin in the 1850s. Women always kind of existed in, in that upper echelon if they were talented enough to be writers and painters and stuff like that. Politics was always closed off to them. Um, but now in the 60s, because so many people were demanding that second car and the microwave oven and et cetera, there was a lot of pressure on women to enter the workplace. Um, and so women started to want to delay having children. They wanted to space out those children when they were born, and they wanted to have fewer of them so that they could get their education in order and their career in order. Yet there were barriers everywhere. Um, when my mother went to school, she went to a Catholic high school in Downey, Pius X, there were no female athletics. Girls did not play sports. Boys played sports. There were these weird gender theories prior to the 70s that taught that if women exercised a lot, their bodies would get really muscular and there'd be too much testosterone and it would like impede their ability to get pregnant, to have children. They would become gay, uh, which is just crazy, but that's the way that, that people thought back then. They thought that women's bodies should be soft, you know, that, that they should not exercise, that that was a masculine thing to do. And those gender roles were enforced by government and society. Women could not enter marathon races. I think the first woman that ever ran in an American marathon was in the 70s, like 1971 or 72 in the Boston Marathon. And she was attacked. It was illegal for her to run. And she just went and ran anyway. And men were like tackling her and trying to get her out of it. How dare you try to run? It's like, what do you care if a woman's running, right? Some of these people needed to get lives, but so few people in life actually look at life how it is and analyze it. They just accept it, even the silliness, right? It's like, we always have to evaluate silly things that we do or awful things we do and try to change. Women could not get a bank account in their own name, especially if they were married. Women couldn't get loans. Um, women weren't hired for high, you know, society positions. There were no female doctors or lawyers, a few, but not very many, right? You guys know RBG, God rest her soul. She just passed away last year in September. Ruth Bader Ginsburg graduated from Columbia Law School, which is like a top five law school in the country. It's Ivy League. Uh, she was first in her class. She was editor of the Law Review. Uh, this was, I think, 1958 or so. She was unemployable. Top law student in the country and she could not get a job at any law firm because the thought at the time was, well, a woman is gonna immediately get married, have kids, and then she's gonna not work anymore. So why should we even hire her? That's just crazy, right? Which 
that's the way that people thought back then. The attitude was that men should make more than women because men have families dependent on them. Women don't, at least that's what they thought. It was weird, like women lived in an alternate universe where their income didn't go to their families. It was crazy to think that way, but the thought was you have a man and a woman interviewing for a position, the man has to support a family. The woman, her income is like gravy. It's like extra. Her husband should be making the money. So the man needs the job more than the woman. So we're going to hire the man. If we have two candidates that are, you know, the same and we hire both, the woman's going to earn less because she doesn't need to make as much. And it'll hurt the guy's feelings since he has to support a family and she's making all this just extra income, right? And so this was just institutionalized everywhere. My mother married my father in 1970. They, uh, my mother really straightened up my dad. My dad had been to Vietnam, he had been in the army, but he never got his college education. He kind of just was messing around after high school, got drafted, went to the army, got out, and he was just sort of, you know, had his job and was having fun, you know? She was younger, she was 23, my father was 27. And my mother said, hey, I love you. You know, they met, they fell in love. And she's like, I'm not gonna marry you uh, if you don't have a plan to get out of your job welding headers at this, you know, uh, car shop. I want you to get an actual job. So you got to get your college degree. You're a veteran. Go get your GI Bill and go back to school. So he agreed. They got married. She supported him and they wanted to buy a house. So they went to a bank and they looked at getting a loan and the loan officer, it was like his head exploded. He couldn't figure it out. He said, whoa, you're the woman and you're supporting your husband. Oh, that's just insane. All right. Well, this is highly irregular, but I guess we'll do it. I get so mad when I tell this story every year. That man made my mother go to her doctor and get a note that said that she was on birth control and therefore she would not get pregnant on accident and have a kid and therefore not be able to work and not be able to support her family. Nowadays, it's like, you cannot do that. That's illegal. And the idea is like, so what? You get pregnant, you have a kid, you go back to work in a couple of months, you use your sick leave. What's the big deal? In the 60s, the attitude was still that when a woman gives birth, she needs to stay home for five years until that kid goes to kindergarten. You don't take your kid to daycare. No, nobody took their kids to daycare, hardly. The attitude was women who did that were selfish. They loved their career. They hated their children. Their children would become criminals. Or the theory at the time was that they would become gay, that gay children, like boys became gay because they didn't know how to associate with their mother because their mother abandoned them and went to work. It was ridiculous, beyond ridiculous theories. And my mother told me when that bank, bank manager made her do that, she went home and cried. And I get so mad. I'm, if that guy was still alive, I'd go pay him a visit and slap him around today because that was humiliating, dehumanizing, ridiculous. That was 1970, folks. That I'm not talking about like 1941. That was in 1970 after the supposedly, you know, huge movement of, of the 1960s. So women did make a huge amount of progress in the 60s. It's still not perfect. We've still got a ways to go, but it's way better than it used to be. Um, so part of this goes back to Rosie the Riveter, right? People from my grandmother's generations who got second jobs in the 50s and 60s. And when they were faced with all this, you know, barriers like, oh, well, a woman can't be a police officer. A woman can't be a lawyer. A woman can't be a soldier. They would say, hey, I, I was in a factory in World War II. I made bombs. What are you talking about? You can't talk to me this way because I know different. And so they instilled their daughters with that kind of spirit, like, hey, we helped win World War II. We were, you know, out there working, making the weapons of war. Some of us served in the military as code breakers and, and wax and waves. Betty Friedan posted The Feminine Mystique in, I believe, 62 or 63. And it, it laid out this hypothesis that women were not happy and content at home, that they wanted to go into the workplace. They wanted something more for themselves. And why not? They should be able to do whatever a man could do. This organization was founded in the early 60s. Now, the National Organization for Women, feminist organization that started to raise money and, and give to politicians who would talk about these issues. And then we have the Civil Rights Act of 64, which put in its, forgive me, I think it's Title VII, I'm not looking at my slide right now, but the one that's about fair employment, about hiring and firing. Believe it or not, that was inserted into the law to torpedo it right? Like racist Southerners who did not want the Civil Rights Act of 64 to pass, where it said, you know, on the job discrimination is illegal on the basis of race. They said, we want to add and sex to that clause so that gender discrimination is also outlawed. Thinking 
No one will vote for that because then you couldn't discriminate against a woman in the workplace, right? Oh, that's so silly. That's so ridiculous. And guess what? It didn't torpedo the law. People still passed it. And now there was federal government support. Women could call the federal government and say, I'm being discriminated against on my job. I'm the last hired. I'm the first fired. I'm not paid as much. And so that gave a huge boost to equality as well. The pay gap, which still exists, but it's shrunken quite a bit. It's very persistent, and I'll talk about this in a minute, but uh, there's various reasons today why it, why it still exists. The reason in 1964 was businesses institutionally just paid women less. Women earned 59 cents on the dollar compared to men. Now, that gap today is, last I looked, it's about 80, right? So women make about 80 cents on the dollar for men. Uh, but it's very different. It is illegal today at a job, right? Like it, people imagine it means like, oh, okay, Osborne, he's a male, he must make X. And then female teacher like Heinz, she must make 0.8 X, right? Because she's a woman, she's paid 80 cents on the dollar. That's not quite how it works. What they do is they take every man who works full-time and every woman who works full-time and they calculate their average incomes. And it comes out that on average, men tend to make more in the aggregate, even though women are better educated. I saw a statistic from the federal government recently that said, if you are a Hispanic woman or a Native American woman, you're more likely to have a bachelor's degree than a white man in this country. Yet white men tend to make quite a bit more. Now there's, this gets so complex and intersectional. There's race, there's gender, there's class, there's all kinds of stuff. But it seems to be, and I'm not smart enough to figure out if this is environment or uh, or if it's biological, but women seem to want to be in different jobs as men. Okay. And I'm sorry if that seems sexist, but here's what I mean. I mean, the evidence is just all around us, right? Like when I, I, I started to realize this stuff when I had a kid, because the second we got him into daycare and then preschool, every person at the daycare and preschool was a woman. Every person in my son's life was a woman. His swim instructor was a woman. His uh, daycare, you know, provider was a woman, uh, kindergarten teacher, first grade teacher. Men don't want to be kindergarten teachers or first grade teachers for whatever reason. Okay. Some of that's societal, but I think some of it's just biological. Uh, sorry again, if that sounds sexist, but I do tend to think men and women in the aggregate, not to a person, but in the aggregate, I, they seem to be wired a little different. Look at Millican high school. Uh, almost all the men in the history department want to teach 11th and 12th grade, almost all the women seem to want to teach 9th and 10th. And no one forced them to do that. They just seem to want to do that. Um, look at, my wife teaches an elementary school where there's 25 teacher, four are men, 21 are women, right? Uh, I talked to one of my best friends the other day and, and uh, his kid is starting to go to Grace First Presbyterian, just like my kid did. And, and I asked, I said, have they hired a man there yet? Because it's literally all women there. And he said, uh, the music instructor that comes once a week is a man and they get all kinds of complaints because it's very interesting. If a man wants to be around kids, it's like, ooh, that's kind of weird, right? I I've noticed this stuff now that I'm, I have a kid, like I said, if I just like showed up at my local park, I get eyes on me like, who's that weirdo who's just hanging out at the park? Ooh, right, I'll hide your kids. But if I show up with a baby stroller and my kid and, and a dog, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, now he's a decent guy, right? He's not this kind of weirdo. So we still have these gender roles in mind when we look at society, I think. Um, and uh, for whatever reason, men become petroleum engineers and, and women become, you know, um, pediatricians and such. Women are in biology and they do become doctors, but most uh, gravitate towards uh, pediatrics and want to work with children. Okay, it could be society enforced, it could be, you know, individual choices, whatever the case is, that's why the pay gap exists today, that and the fact that women have children. And, and that all the advances we've made in, in tech and in, in society, women still, and my wife went through this, she felt intense pressure to stay home. You stay home, you lose out on that career, right? Your job's still there waiting for you, but you fall behind in the pay scale, you fall behind in promotion. And still, my kid's seven now, and it's my wife who usually wants to do the stuff related to, you know, supporting our kid. And, and here's what I mean. Like I'm, I'll do the homework with them. I'll go to baseball practice, but forgive me the silly things they have you do for school, like the jogathon and the fitathon. She's the one that takes the form and pesters all of our neighbors and family to go fill it out. Cause she tells me, she's like, I want to be a good mom and I want to go do this. 
and I don't know what it is. Maybe I'm wired differently. I just say, I don't care what other people say about the jogathon or fitathon. Maybe they'll say I'm a bad dad, but I just don't care. Also, society doesn't hold me up to that standard. Women have to be great at everything, right? Women have to be number one at their career and um, mom of the century. And if they fall down on that, people think weird things about them, right? It's weird. I, I catch myself kind of having these thoughts and I have to go, oh, wait, that's not fair, right? Like if I know someone who's divorced, right? If I know a guy who's divorced and he has sole custody of the kids and the woman doesn't, I automatically think what's wrong with her. Does she not like her kids? Is she a drug addict? Like, why did she not even fight for custody of her kids? That's weird. A woman always typically does that, right? And I have to say, wait a minute, that's not the right way to think about this, right? You got to get out of those gender stereotypes. We still, I think, think this way as a society, but I think your generation is changing things. I think that's good. And even my generation is far different, right? I go to every pediatrician appointment with my kid. My mother's, wow, you're a good dad. Your father never went to a doctor's appointment with you, right? I cook dinner, I change the diapers, uh, you know, I, I feel like I should do all of that kind of stuff. Baby boomer generation and, and all those older and it just said, men don't do that stuff. We just don't. Um, so things started to change. The birth control pill came out in 1960. Women could now get this uh, treatment very, very cheap and it liberated them. They could have kids later. Like I said, they weren't at the whims of their own biology and their husband to have a kid whenever biology determined they would, they could have it when they, when they wanted and it liberated them in several ways. Abortion, very dicey topic. The women's uh, rights movement, the feminist movement has very much uh, embraced it. Conservatives in the country very much not. And so it's, it's still this very dicey issue, but nonetheless, women latched onto it and said, we need to start fighting for this too. And so you see abortion laws start to change in the early 70s. First, New York and California and a lot handful of states started to say, OK, you know, certain periods of time in the first, you know, 12 weeks or so, we can legalize it because um, it was very dangerous before that. Women would go to, you know, doctors kind of after hours who would perform it. It was not safe. It was not licensed. And women were dying. Uh, you know, thousands of women every year would die in these abortions that weren't performed very well. Um, and so that started to change. Roe v. Wade is decided in 1973, the Supreme Court invalidates every anti-abortion law in the country. And so we're still dealing with that today. Like, you know, Supreme Court's a lot more conservative now, it might change. Uh, rape and consent laws, uh, very touchy topic, but the idea, um, the definition of sexual assault was way different in the 60s. Uh, there was a lot of victim blaming. There was a lot, like for instance, in college, when women went away to college, yes, they were allowed to go to college, but the dorms were segregated, right? There were men's dorms, there were women dorms. The attitude was a man is an adult. They have freedom to move out whenever they want. The ladies dorm, there was like an old woman who like lived in the dorm and she had like a little checklist at the end of the night. And 11 p.m., it was lights out. And they went around and checked to make sure every student, every female student was in that dormitory and then they locked it for the night. Like Rapunzel in their tower, having to like save the virgin from the, the awful outside world. Way different universe today. I was shocked when I visited my friends in the 90s at UCLA to find the co-ed dorms there. Even the bathrooms were co-ed. I just said, whoa, this is really interesting. It's way different than I thought. And guess what? Society has not fallen apart, right? We, we can do those kind of things. And so attitudes started to change about, you know, women being able to go out in public and go to parties and drink and that they don't lose consent just because they have a drink or two or go to a man's house. That was always the thing. Well, you said that, you know, he sexually assaulted you, but you went to his room voluntarily. Didn't you know what he was going to do? Our dynamics have started to change about that. We start to say, no, 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 you know, consent is absolute. You don't give it up just because you have a drink or you go to a guy's house or room, right? Pregnancy discrimination. Women used to be like women who were teachers to just automatically fired as soon as they announced that they were pregnant. That's just unheard of today. They just thought it would be weird for kids to be around a pregnant woman and ask questions. And uh, the feeling was that pregnancy was a severe health condition and you had to go home and like rest your body and just sit around all day. We know that that's not the case anymore. My, my wife ran a half marathon when she was six months pregnant with our kid. It scared me, but our doctor assured us and said it's actually no, no danger or anything like that. Women are much sturdier and strong than men give them credit for. Workplace discrimination, contracts, confidentiality. 
Um, I love the show Mad Men. It debuted in 2008. And in the first episode, it was shocking. There's this woman, Betty Draper. She's very unhappy in her marriage. She goes and talks to a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist is talking to her for the hour. The session ends. Betty Draper goes home. And the doctor calls up the husband and said, your wife's a very disturbed woman. And let me tell you everything we talked about which is just, it blows your mind. You're like, wait a minute, the woman's like a child and the husband is like in care of the wife, even though she's an adult. Yeah, that's how the law worked. But we've come a long way. We really need to do, recognize that, that I'm not saying we should be satisfied with the way things are, but you have to look at, you know, the, uh, uh, I don't quite know how to say it, the theology of this, right? The, the you know, chronology of this, that, it was horrific and it's much better now. It's not perfect, but we are moving in a be much better direction, I think. Um, sports and Title IX, right? We now have female athletics at every campus. Uh, we try to fund them as equal as possible. There's still discrimination. Like, you know, the women's national team has testified in front of Congress recently because they win the World Cup and they get paid a fraction of what the guys make. And the guys are horrible. Our men's national team are just awful. They didn't even qualify for the 2018 World Cup. The women win the championship and they're paid like half or not even half, right? And so there's a reevaluation of this. In the 60s, the female athletes, that's crazy. Like they just weren't, there was no female athletics, right? And no fault divorce. This was a game changer. Uh, this blows my mind. When you look at an old movie from like the 20s or something, it used to be in all 50 states, in order to get divorced, you had to show cause. You couldn't just say, we don't get along. The number one reason today that people get divorced is called irreconcilable differences. It's a very vague term that just means we can't get along. We're too different, right? And so this was a phenomenon of the 60s. Feminists started to push for it because there were millions of women that were in horrible marriages, abusive husband, alcoholic, or just neglectful, just came home when he wanted to come home, disappeared for three days on end, had affairs. You could not get divorced and just take the kids and go to your mom's house. Those were his kids. You would be kidnapping if you did that. So women just stuck it out. And uh, so in the 20s, if you wanted to get divorced, you had to show cause. You had to demonstrate that there was infidelity or something like that, right? And you couldn't just say, oh, well, my husband cheated on me. You had to bring the mistress and she had to testify in court. It was a big, messy thing that almost nobody had the money to go through. So people stayed together. Happy or not, they stayed together. One by one, the liberal states like New York and in California started to legalize no-fault divorce. Just both parties agree to get married, but either one of them can just leave at any time. And of course the divorce rate will skyrocket. It, it goes up pretty high in the 70s and 80s. Uh, not higher than most other advanced countries, but many conservatives have lamented this ever since. And I get it, divorce is not a good thing. It's, it's very tough on everybody involved. But to me, here's the myth in all of this, that families were happy before the 60s. And then in the 60s, they just decided, you know, you can get divorced. And people are lazy. They don't want to work on their relationships. They want to be selfish and happy, you know? And so they decide, ah, I'm just going to, you know, leave. I think there's a little of that, but speaking as someone who my brother went through a divorce and it was horrible, um, I hate to say this, but it was the best thing in the world for him. He married a horrible human being. Thank God they didn't have kids together so he could just walk away. Uh, and she was no good for him. He could have stayed for another 50 years and been miserable the rest of his life. And he just decided, I can't take this anymore. She's treating me horribly and I'm leaving. I've given her a million chances. He got remarried. He has two wonderful kids. I love my nieces. I love his new wife. They're very wonderful. Um, and I'm glad he had the right to just walk away from it all and not take her to court and prove all this stuff, all this nonsense. Um, but speaking from experience, it was not easy. He, he, you know, went through a lot in that experience. And again, they didn't even have kids that they had to, to deal with and stuff like that. So we have come a super long way, but again, you know, there's no reason to get complacent and, uh, you know, there's always room for progress to be made, but look at where we were before. Women really were second-class citizens in this country and we've come a, a much longer way, right? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say there's advantages to being a, a woman, but it, it's complicated, but women live longer than men, okay? I just mentioned a, a minute ago that women are more likely to have a better education than men. Look at the Quest program, you know, it's two thirds female, okay? Women do very well in the classroom. Women do very well in most workplaces. Women completely dominate the biological fields. 
um, completely. Uh, biological study programs at every university are mostly dominated by women, which is great. Uh, uh, sad that most of those jobs don't pay as well as you know the jobs that men traditionally get into. There's also other jobs that men traditionally do, like longshoreman, truck driver, where those wages, because they're unionized, are artificially very high, even though you don't need an education and you're working class. You don't get that if you're a preschool teacher, right? You don't have you know the college degree, et cetera, and you're doing a very hard job, but you're being paid significantly less. And so very complicated, but interesting nonetheless. All right. Um, Okay, we're almost an hour in. I think I can finish this slide and then we'll pick up on that next time. Then there was the student movement. Um, it, what's amazing to me is that prior to 1964, on most college campuses, they did not allow you to hold political rallies at all. And this was the 60s. In 1964, there was the Civil Rights Act and Lyndon Johnson started bombing Vietnam during that time period. There was a war going on. So students at Berkeley, went out and started protesting and demonstrating. Uh, they had their tables out, they were passing out literature and the Berkeley police showed up and said, you guys can't have that here. These are 18 year olds and above speaking and talking about political issues, not rioting or anything, they're just talking. And yet that was against the college policy. They basically said, you guys don't know enough, you're not educated enough. And the school deems that you can't do this on campus. And so uh, the police started to arrest a handful of these people and then just, out of nowhere, this call went through campus. Everyone just descended on the campus. This is a picture here, if you can't quite see it. Well, it's a picture of this huge crowd that just went out and surrounded the police squad car and they couldn't move for 18 hours. They just surrounded it with the kid handcuffed in the back, couldn't take him away. And people would get up on top of the squad car and give speeches and they just stayed there. And eventually they just let the kid go. There was this negotiation process that went back and forth between the students and the faculty. And finally, they agreed that there would be free speech on campus, that you would be co-equal with adults in the rest of the country and government through the university could not arrest you or expel you or do anything because of your political speech, which was wonderful. So this was like an H-bomb of, of political action all over the country. Every college campus in the country started to talk every day about the Vietnam War, about segregation, about racism, about civil rights. And campuses became these sort of hotbeds of political activism, like speakers would hit the college campus tour, right? Now, many conservatives have, have said that, you know, the problem today is that there isn't as much free speech on campus because Campuses, it's odd. Before the 60s, campuses used to be rigidly conservative. I know it's strange, but it's true. Most conservatives or most colleges were exceedingly conservative before the 60s. What happened is these students who went out and protested and stuff, almost all of them go into academia after they get their degrees and they take over most of the campuses and they create a very liberal environment, right? Like if you're unaware of this, America's this big, huge country. But there's little subcultures around, right? The military is incredibly conservative. Police departments tend to be very conservative. Teachers tend to be very liberal. And uh, academia, like college professors, tend to be very, very liberal. It's just sort of, you know, certain jobs attract certain types of people, right? Um, and so uh, today, if you're a conservative, it's very hard to get booked on several college campuses. I feel for them. I wouldn't want to be a young conservative at Berkeley today. It's like, you're probably not very welcome debating certain issues. And um, a lot of people get shouted down. They try to have conservatives, you know, come on campus to talk about issues and people will riot and boycott and shout them down when they try to speak. This is, you know, an issue. It might be overblown, I'm not sure, but, you know, there is an issue uh, on campuses today about sort of the lack of freedom of speech. But I will tell you, it's far better than what it was before, which was you can't talk at all, right? Just go to class and study and shut up. You're not an adult. We don't care what you think. At least now there's somewhat of a debate going on, although it's very one sided because college campuses are very liberal. Um, so moving on, how are we doing? Okay, I still have a little bit of time. So let's talk about the Warren court. Here he is, Earl Warren, former governor of California. Oh, I think I had mentioned Earl Warren before in my other lectures on civil rights. He was from Alameda County from Oakland. He uh, was a district attorney there and you know, prosecutor. And uh, then he became in uh, the 40s, he became governor of California. He was governor of California during World War II. And Earl Warren did something very shameful that he apologized for the rest of his life. He supported the Japanese internment. 
1942, most white folks felt that the 100,000 or so Japanese Americans living in California were a security threat, they might work with the enemy, and they had to be arrested and detained. So he supported it. Now, he didn't do it, but he supported it. Uh, and then felt horrible about it ever the rest of his life. He apologized. He met with Japanese American, you know, civil rights groups and apologized ever after. He was part of the big push to get them reparations in the 80s, which they eventually got. Um, and then he wanted to make a big difference. He became, you know, prominent in Republican politics. Eisenhower wanted him to be his vice president, but Richard Nixon outmaneuvered them both at the convention. So Ike nominated Earl Warren to the Supreme Court and he becomes Chief Justice. And I think I mentioned before, he'd never been a judge in his whole life. He was just a prosecutor and now he's Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, which is pretty extraordinary. Excuse me. His first major case was Brown v. Board of Education, which was monumental, integrating the schools in America. But then came this huge liberal rebellion on the Supreme Court. It's very interesting. The Supreme Court became very activist in the 60s. They saw a lot wrong with America that they felt violated the Constitution, and so they started to change stuff. For instance, Map v. Ohio. This is a search and seizure case. It, it, it might blow your mind. It certainly blows my mind to, to understand that prior to 1961, the Fourth Amendment that says you got to get a warrant before you search someone's home, that only applied to the federal government, to the FBI, to the DEA, right? They couldn't just kick in your door and start a search. They had to get a warrant. What about the states? Do the states have to? Not if they don't want to. Some states had like an equivalent of a Fourth Amendment in their state constitution and therefore abided by it. Others did not. And so Ohio, and this is one of the silliest cases ever, Mrs. Mapp, she was basically a madam. She ran not a house of prostitution, but she ran a house of pornography. Like pornography was highly illegal in the 60s. It was run by the mafia and distributed just to people who sold it out of their houses. And so people would come and knock on your door and then you'd like sell it to them and it was illegal. And so they caught Mrs. Mapp in like a sting operation selling pornography, you know, undercover. And uh, they searched her home without a warrant. They did not go through the proper investigative purchases. They just knocked down her door, went in, someone ratted her out and they went in and, you know, found all the materials and sentenced her to a long prison sentence. She appealed because she had money and a lawyer and they said, you can't just search someone's home. That evidence must be excluded from the trial. The federal government had never done that before. And on the one hand, most people today would say that was the right thing to do. You know, we all deserve these sort of civil rights and civil liberties, but Americans are law and order type people. They just are. Like the, there's no politician anywhere who wants to stand up for criminal rights or the rights of the accused because Americans are tough on crime basically. Now that's changing a bit, but still, and most Americans, you know, we're, we're not usually wanting to stick up for the accused or, or criminals. And so this lost a lot of support that liberals had in the country. Ingle versus Vitale, this is another, you know, hot button issue. This is prayer in public schools. Now you guys are of a much generation, honestly, so am I, that, than the boomers and everyone before. It was completely normal and very regular that at most public schools, uh, prayers would be said almost every day, N not just in the private schools, but in the public schools. Now, they were usually non-denominational, but they'd be from the Bible, so it would encompass all Christians, right? It didn't matter if you were Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, Catholic, whatever. You'd read a generic prayer about whatever issue you were trying to teach the kids, and, um, and that was considered fine. Starting in the early 60s, though, there began to be, you know, a movement, you know, much like the movement or whatever you want to call it, wokeism or anything today that's, you know, trying to show people, you know, the injustice of certain issues. Many people said, you know what, this forcing people to read the Bible is infringing on their rights. What about Muslims? What about Hindus? What about Jews? What about atheists and agnostics who don't believe in any of these ideologies? You're forcing them to read a book that they don't believe in? That's violating their rights. And so the Supreme Court in two cases, Engel versus Vitale, and then a companion one, Lemon versus Kurtzman, they said, can't do it anymore. Now, if a, students want to voluntarily meet like at lunch and have a prayer meeting or, you know, uh, something like that, where it's volu voluntarily done, then that's fine. You can even have a Bible as literature class, but notice you're studying the Bible as literature, not as scripture, not as the word of God. Um, so this issue gets very dicey, but conservatives get very angry at this. They want God back in the schools and they often blame it for the downfall of society, that there's no morality in schools anymore because we don't 
teach them the Bible. We don't teach them, you know, uh, God's code, etc. I don't know exactly if I buy into all of that, but I do understand it, it makes people upset. People in America like local control. They like to think that if we take over the school board and citizens here want a change in the schools, we should be able to do it. And the Supreme Court needs to just butt the heck out. We should be able to do what we want. Baker versus Carr. This is a very complicated case about reapportionment. But basically in Texas, they had one county that had a very small population, but equal representation of another county that was much bigger in its size. And so the Supreme Court forced them to reapportion all of their counties so that they were equal, which I like the decision, but to me, it, it ignores a glaring disparency, uh, discrepancy, I should say. And that is, what about the Senate, right? The, California has 40 million people and we get the same representation as Wyoming. I don't think you'll get a Supreme Court to nullify the entire Senate, but it's like federally that seems okay, but on a state level, you can't have counties that are worth more than others if the population is uh, identical, you know. Gideon versus Wainwright, this is your right to an attorney. Amazingly, most states in the early 60s said if you are accused and standing before, you know, a trial accused, um, the court did not have to pay for your attorney, only if you were facing the death penalty. So this guy, uh, Clarence Earl Gideon, he was, you know, not a reputable guy. He was a lifelong criminal, an old man that had been locked away for breaking and entering, basically. He broke into a pool hall after hours, and he stole some money from the jukebox. Not like, a, you know, a real threat to society, but it was his third strike, and he was from Florida, and he was going to prison for life for this sort of accumulation of, you know, small crimes. And he had a lot of free time, so he read a lot of law books and wrote to the Supreme Court in pencil and described his case and basically said, I never got an attorney. And I never read the Sixth Amendment before. It says I have the right to hire one. No one had ever thought that that's what a, the right to an attorney means. From the 1790s, when the Bill of Rights was written, everybody understood it from like the Middle Ages as you should be able to hire an attorney if you can afford one, right? Because it used to be in England, if the king didn't like you, he'd say, you're standing trial and you don't have the right to even communicate with an attorney and you'll stand trial without one. But it's like, hey, I'm a political enemy of the king and I'm rich, I'm a nobleman and I want to hire an attorney. And it was the rights of those people. That's what the Sixth Amendment really meant when it was written. But now it was being reinterpreted to say, yes, even if you're poor, you do have the right to an attorney, no matter if it's the low, lowliest level of crime imaginable, you still have that right. And so the Supreme Court overturned his conviction and let him out of jail and said, you never got your, uh, your day in court uh, uh, having an attorney. Griswold versus Connecticut. Birth control is approved by the FDA in 1960. And wouldn't you know it, several states tried to outlaw it anyway. Now. Of all states, Connecticut, if you guys don't know, Connecticut is A, the richest state in the union per capita, B, one of the most liberal states in the union. It's amazing to me that they ever pass an anti-birth control law. Again, this is not Mississippi, this is Connecticut. Connecticut's a weird state where it was incredibly waspy in the colonial period and for decades afterwards, but the Catholics said, won by this point. By 1965, there was so much Irish and Italian immigration into Connecticut and Catholic families do tend to have bigger families than Protestant families. And over time, uh, they sort of won, right? And so Protestants always had anti-birth control laws on the statutes because their theory was, this is ridiculous, but this, is, this was the thoughts of the lawmakers at the time. If we allow birth control, Protestant women will use it because our churches say you can use it. And so we're gonna have fewer babies. Catholics, it's, against their religion to have it. The Pope speaks out against it, so they're not going to use it. And so if we allow birth control, there'll be fewer Protestants than Catholics, and Catholics will take over the state. Now, once Catholics did take over the state in the 50s, and they became the majority, they kept the laws on the books because they genuinely thought birth control was the destruction of life. And so you have this leftover law from like the 20s, which seemed kind of crazy. The Supreme Court took this issue up, the uh, Griswold family sued. They were a married couple who wanted to use birth control and they were gonna go to prison for it as they went to a doctor and got their prescription. So the Supreme Court said, you have a right to privacy, right? And the right to privacy doesn't mean what you might think it means, like, oh, the government can't look at certain things. What it means is that there's certain sensitive areas in life that are so private that government can't say anything about it. So that a married couple who wants to use birth control 
why are we even looking into that? That's the most sacred of all institutions in life is marriage and the family and just butt out. You don't have any right to say anything about how many kids you should have, right? Uh, it's very interesting. The Supreme Court struck down a lot of this. There were these um, uh, sort of sterilization laws in the 20s and 30s. Oklahoma had won three felonies and you would be sterilized. Men would be forcibly uh, given a, a vasectomy if they had three crimes, because the idea was crime was hereditary. Um, the Supreme Court struck this down and they said, even if you're a convicted felon, you have the right to procreate. That is a sacred right that can't be taken away, right? That's what do we usually think of when we think of China, one of these totalitarian regimes, they literally tell you how many kids to have. They tell you no more than one. That has changed in recent years, but for decades, one child only, and you get punished if you have that second child. It seems very draconian and strict and totalitarian to Americans, right? And so other laws came about where they started to say this, right? You have the right to procreate, and that includes, you know, the right to not procreate if you want birth control. This was later extended to abortion where it becomes very controversial, but most Americans today believe, yeah, you should have the right to birth control. Um, and then Miranda versus Arizona, right? Uh, the number one way that police caught criminals, and still to this day, the number one way that they catch them is that criminals typically confess. It's not like when you watch these TV shows where there's these masterminds and they can outsmart the cops. Most times, if you get somebody you know, in a room and start interrogating them, they get stressed out and they just confess. And they're like, yeah, I did it, I'll sign the statement. Um, now in the olden days, it was pretty awful. Police would routinely beat subjects into confession and the confession was worthless and innocent people were locked up quite constantly. Now you might say, well, it's like that today. It's much better than it used to be. It used to be atrocious. Um, because we weren't video recording everybody uh, back then. They didn't, they didn't have that technology. So Miranda was this gentleman, Latino gentleman from Arizona, and he was arrested and the cops just started asking him questions and he admitted it. Well, the Fifth Amendment says that you have the right to uh, not incriminate yourself. Now, again, the way we always understood that is, well, once your trial is going on, you have the right to not take the stand. But if you're arrested, you got to talk to the cops. Earl Warren, again, great judge because he didn't care about jurisprudence very much. He just said, well, your trial begins long before your first court date. It begins the second you're arrested. So you should be told when you're arrested that you don't have to actually answer questions and you can have a lawyer present if you do. So you guys all know the mantra, right? Every cop show that you've ever seen all says it, right? You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney. If you can't afford an attorney, one will be appointed free of charge by the court. And then the last thing they always say is, do you understand your rights as I've read them to you? If you say no, then they read them again. And if you say yes, they go, okay, you understand your rights. Would you like to answer questions? And at that point you can say, you know, I'd rather not. What happens if you confess before your Miranda warnings? Can't be used. What if they give you your Miranda rights and you don't want to answer questions, but they force you to anyway? That's thrown out, okay? So it's, it's a much more liberalized system now than it used to be. And I would argue much better. But again, the way most Americans interpreted this is the Supreme Court are letting criminals out of prison, right? That, it, 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 and it coincided at a time when the crime rate was escalating. Crime was very low in the 40s and 50s. Uh, even in the 30s, it was pretty low. And it started to tick up in the 60s and 70s, pretty drastically. And at the same time, the Supreme Court was making it tougher on cops and easier on criminals, so people thought. And so Earl Warren lost a lot of popularity. You saw like people had these impeach Earl Warren signs all over the country. Uh, now, liberals loved him. The ACLU absolutely adored him, but conservative America did not like this. And this was one of the big reasons why Ronald Reagan would win as governor of California in 1966, because he's like, we need to get tough on crime and I'm going to overturn, you know, all these Supreme Court decisions. I'm going to appoint very conservative judges, right? Richard Nixon wins in 1968, largely because of this backlash, because many people felt the Supreme Court had gone too far. Um, what's interesting is that the Supreme Court has completely changed. Now it's incredibly conservative, but in the 60s, it was incredibly liberal because of FDR and Truman, and then Kennedy and Johnson, who packed the court with very liberal judges. Even Eisenhower had four nominees to the court. Two were very liberal, only two were kind of conservative. So from 1933 to the you know 1970s, there was only about two conservatives ever appointed to the court. So it was very liberal, and these were the decisions you got. They changed America. 
Uh, and I'm not saying for, for better or for worse, but just different. Okay, we will start talking about the hippies next time. There they are. They're all laying down in a big pile, probably tripping, listening to, you know, some kind of acid rock or something like that. We'll talk about the counterculture movement in the late 60s next time, and then start to get into the Vietnam War and some of this other stuff. Okay. All right, guys, hopefully you enjoyed that. And uh, I will see you next time. Bye-bye.